Um, so anyway, Clyde, unfortunately, after, um, well, first of all, Rose died. So, so um, George was raising Clyde by himself for a couple of years. And then he remarried a woman named Matilda Haar, which I believe is also a German name. And um, they had one son. So in addition to Clyde, they had a son named Marshall. And when Marshall was just a young boy and Matilda was pregnant with Madge, there was a terrible balloon accident an aeronaut, a man that comes and inflates these big balloons and flies over the town. And he brought it into town. He didn't tether it correctly into the ground and it tipped over and hit a, like a tractor trailer type thing that was holding a bunch of kids and killed, killed Clyde. And some other, and, people, and some other people too. And this was carried, this news was carried throughout the state in a lot of the other English speaking um, newspapers, but it was also ironically covered in the Indiana Tribune. So I, that's why I believe there must have still been a pretty strong German connection, especially with the church and everything that he belonged to, even though Matilda had him transfer their membership to a Methodist church at that point. I think they were still very connected to the German community at that time. So after this tragedy, um, I think that I think that George and the family kind of wanted to leave the Clay County area, Clay City area, and they moved up to Indianapolis. And there could have been a few reasons for that. It might have been he was um, getting more ambitious and wanted a, a better job with the post, postal service in Indianapolis. It might have been that they wanted to leave some of this tragedy behind them because Matilda's father had also committed suicide shortly before this, too. So there, there are a lot of bad feelings. You know, the, the newspaper covered the story about Matilda's dad saying wealthy farmer blew his brains out so I think that they just kind of wanted a new start they might have been thinking farther ahead about educating their children because they moved to Irvington which had Butler University at that time until 1928 and a lot of families moved to the area with the intent of sending their kids to that college down the road what happened I'm not moving well, that concludes our. <laughs> I mean, you just have to clear um, because she started the recording. Oh, I'll let you do that. Yeah. Oh, close I'm sorry. Stay tuned. This is good. Okay, I should get you back on. Okay, so um, George moved to Irvington, and again, he bought some property um, in, in the area, and his property, his purchase of property was covered in the German paper too, which again makes me think they still must have had some connection with the German community because the newspaper was still keeping track of them and made note of the purchase that he made. He, um, his early life in Irvington with the family, they went to the Irvington Methodist Episcopal Church, which was what Matilda's family had attended. And the kids at this time, Mar Marshall had a younger sister now named Madge, and they attended the George Julian um, Elementary School. And they started at this school the first year it was open, which was around 1905 or seven, I think it was, when they built a new school. And they started connecting with a lot of people in the community. And I don't know if you're familiar with Hilton U. Brown, but he was the editor of the Indianapolis News. And also he was on the board of directors at Butler for over 50 years. So they were connecting with a lot of pretty prominent people in Irvington. And one of the other people that he, they connected with was Grace Julian Clark, whose father, George Julian Clark, was a US congressman and the first one to put forth a bill for women's suffrage. It didn't go through, but he was the first one that um, initiated that idea. And Grace herself was a suffragist, and she was also a leader in the community and wrote columns for the newspaper. So she mentored Madge and her friends, and some of her other, some of the other women in the community um, also mentored Madge. So she had a lot of exposure to really strong, educated women. Um, at one point, I don't know if you're familiar with Carrie Chapman Catt, who was a suffragist who started the National Association of, okay, Carrie Chapman Catt came to Irvington <coughs> and spoke to Madge's sorority group and their parents. So she was really around some very forward thinking women. Um, these are some of Madge's friends as a child. Um, they described her as kind of a rough and tumble girl. She, um, again, her friends, 
from the neighborhood. You might you'll hear the Kingsbury name again later, but um, she was very involved in things in the park where they would do little plays and skits and things like that, and literary groups. And then she attended Manual Training High School, where she graduated in 1914, and she was involved in several activities there. Um, while she was in high school, she received scholarships to study under some very famous Indiana artists, Otto Starr, Clifton Wheeler, William Forsythe. Nobody in her family even knew this information until I found it. Um, she received, I think, two different scholarships to study um, during the semesters while she was still taking high school classes. And then she also paid for an extra summer to study um, with these artists as well. Nobody in their family has any art that they can connect to her at all, and they had never even heard that she had any artistic skills. But what you see down there, which is obviously illegible, but that's her registration for Heron High School. Still have that available. And one of her classmates is Frederick Polly. Uh... He was quite a bit older, but he took one of the classes with her. And also one of her other classmates was um, George Joe Mess, who was a famous engraver etcher. Um, after high school, she attended Butler College, and this was the campus when it was in Irvington, and it was there until 1928. She lived at that point just a couple of blocks from the college, so she would just walk across a railroad track to the college. She later moved to a larger house that was a little bit farther from the college, but she was able to entertain groups from school, different fraternities and sororities. She was very involved in um, Pi Beta Phi sorority. That was her sorority, and this was one of her close friends. And if you read the book, you'll see that her sorority sisters followed her throughout her life, supported her, supported her honor through the trial, um, came forward during the times when they were trying to um, get him paroled from prison, and they just really stuck with her throughout her life. And even at her funeral, they couldn't find her Pi Phi arrow pin, and so one of her sorority sisters took hers off and pinned it on her casket. So they were very loyal to her throughout her life. This is the dramatic music to go with my presentation. Okay, this is a picture of her in, um, in college, one of her sorority group pictures. And this is a quote from her friend Lena about her personality. And that's the house where she lived when she was entertaining um, several groups of people from the school. It was built by a man named Abin. Roth, I can't say his name, Franz Oppendroff. He was a, a physician who specialized in wi wi uh, women's illnesses and he practiced outside of his home. He actually had an office within the home. He had a telephone built in for taking phone calls, which kind of plays it later. And this is, you know, about the same time that everybody was going to war and, um, or they were going to the war in World War I. And Madge left college just a semester or two early to go work as a teacher, which led her to her future career down the road where she ended up at the state house. She actually took the place of a man who had left his teaching position to go to war and she took his place and then didn't go back to school. Oh, this is a picture of her when she worked downtown. She had various jobs downtown, one of which was with the Eli Lilly company. And that was the, um, the ad that came out right before she was hired. So I'm assuming that this is probably the ad that she answer to get her clerical job at Eli Lilly. And Madge is the one in the light colored suit right here. And it's hard to see in this picture, but they're standing around the um, Indianapolis or Indiana War Memorial. They're at the base of that. So I'm sure this is a group of women that worked downtown that were very independent women and they maybe got together for lunch or something. She eventually ended up at the State House where she worked with the, um, the teaching department, education department, and in that position, she met a woman named Ermina Moore, who was just a little bit older than her um, and kind of showed her the ropes. She bought her own car. She was making a pretty good income for a, a single woman in that era. She bought her own car and she and Ermina drove out to um, California for two months. Now, this is like 1923 when there were no motels. There were very primitive roads. Uh, they would have had to take everything in their car that they might need, like their food, their water, um, anything to change a tire, anything to repair the car. And she and Armina went out there for two months. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of what kind of spirit this woman had and how independent she was. 
at one point she was involved with the politics or she was involved in the teaching department at the state house so she started paying a little bit more attention to legislative things going on that would relate to her job or to the education system in indiana and she got invited to a inaugural dinner for ed jackson at the indiana or indianapolis athletic association and at that event that is where she met dc stevenson they sat across the, the table from each other and at one point even though he brought a date he asked her to dance and dance again and he decided he was very interested in her they only went out a couple times and then she didn't go out with him anymore but apparently she was still on his mind and um this is a little bit about his character that tells you a thing so um now about dc stevenson at this time he was climbing the ladder of the ku klux klan he had joined the Klan in Evansville in about 1922, I think it was, and started climbing the ladder very rapidly. So at the time that Madge met him, he was already the Grand Dragon and held a lot of power in Indiana. He was a millionaire. He, was a millionaire. he made his money by selling the Klan outfits for like $10, keeping $6 for himself and giving $4 to the organization. Um, he also made money by collecting donations at church because the organization was promoted quite a bit through the Protestant churches. 30% of the Protestant population, men, Protestant men in Indiana were part of the Klan. And they considered it like a civic organization as you would like the Masons or I'm trying to think of another, the Elks or whatever. Um, it was often promoted through the churches. It was, um, it was mostly anti-Catholic, nativist, anti-immigrant, anti-black but to a little bit lesser degree at that point um and you know anti-jewish and ron has a great example down in jasper indiana which is a jewish community i mean just, uh, i don't know if it's on there yeah okay in jasper indiana it's a sister it's right next door to huntingburg indiana jasper is very much catholic nobody in that community was in the clan but right next door in huntingburg where they were mostly protestant there was a large clan membership there. Next. And there were women's groups. Um, I have a, a yearbook from Center Grove High School where they're promoting the Klan Club for the high school students. It was very prominent. And they just didn't show a picture with names on it. Right. And there things. were even groups that, for example, um, the women's groups were very prominent. And there was one, one Klan woman leader who if you're familiar with the whole plan story, she was a Quaker, which really surprised me that a Quaker woman would be a Klan club leader. These are some more examples of how. Down the this is Huntingburg? No, it's left. Oh, yeah, that, that's a funeral in Huntingburg. Okay. Yeah. So it was very prominent. And there were, it was so, it was so intense that most of the businesses that were part of the Klan would put a sign on their window that would say TK. Well, TWK trade with the Klan. And so there was a lot of pressure to join the Klan because if you didn't, people would go to these other businesses and ignore your business and you could go under pretty quickly. Um, DC Stevenson ruled the Republican Party in Indiana and um, pretty much controlled the police department. He just really had his hands in everything and that's how he got Ed Jackson into office. These are two of his sidekicks that were um, they, he considered them bodyguards, but this one, no, this one in particular, was involved in the crime against Madge, and I'll tell you in a minute how that came about. Very, very arrogant group. Um, he moved to Irvington and decided to buy this house, which was formerly a, a family-owned home by the Graham family, mm -hmm. and then the Grahams rented it to the Kappa Kappa Gamma sorority for a while, and at that point, D.C. Stevenson bought it, for it from them and decided to totally renovate it to look like a mansion. Southern back. Yeah, and he and the, looked like the Klan mansion. And he opened up a couple rooms on the main floor so that it was more um, conducive to entertaining crowds. He invited a lot of politicians over and a lot of prominent people. He served a lot of alcohol during Prohibition. He, um, you know, there's stories of the debauchery there, for example, um, having women dance half naked and whipping them, and whoever lasted the longest from the pain got to spend the night in the bed with them. So just a lot of really behind the scene things that nobody talked about, but he had a lot of um, a lot of dirt on a lot of important people in Indiana, and he kept track of that information 
or down the road when he might need it. So he invited Madge, this is after they had gone out a couple of times, he invited her to his home one night under the guise that he needed some help with a project that he was writing a book about nutrition. And um, she's like, well, I just got home. Can I come tomorrow? And her mom insisted, no, he's called several times today. You need to go down there tonight. He's leaving town tomorrow. So he sent one of his henchmen down to pick her up. It was only about four blocks, well, about a quarter of a mile from her house to his house. So this man came down and escorted him, her down to his house. Um, she left in a hurry. She had just come home from a date. So she just kind of whipped her coat back on. Didn't take a purse, didn't take a hat, which was very important for a woman of that era to have a hat on. And when she got to his house, she realized how intoxicated he was. Um, they encircled her, they forced her to drink, they showed her their pistols, and Stevenson abducted her and took her on a train to originally to Chicago um, to, on some kind of project that he was going to make some money. And this Earl Gentry, one of her, his sidekicks, went with her and him. And the whole time Earl Gentry was up in the berth, the upper berth, and Stevenson was down below molesting Madge. And when I say molesting Madge, it wasn't just, I mean, as if this isn't enough. He not only raped her, but he viciously bit her all over her body. She had a bruise on her hip the size of a dinner plate, and she was still intoxicated or drugged by what they had given her at home. So she really just was in shock, basically. Um, these, this is hard to see up close, but you can just tell by the list of injuries how severe it was. These, this information was taken from her autopsy that I analyzed and broke down and then tried, I had somebody make a graph of all the injuries that she had, had inflicted on her. She was then taken from the train to the Hotel Indiana in, in a Hammond because Stevenson, I think, realized if he crossed state lines, it was going to be a really bad deal for him if he got caught. He kept her there um, all morning and while he was asleep, or, well, at one point she talked him into letting the driver take her to get a hat because again, women didn't go anywhere with a hat. Without a hat, it was very suspicious for her to be around without the hat. And what she did while she was out was she told him she needed to go get some rouge for her face. But instead she bought some bichloride of mercury, which was an over-the-counter disinfectant with the intention of killing herself. And people often ask, why did she call for help? Why didn't she say something to the drugstore owner? But again, she was still not thinking straight. She was shamed and embarrassed because of this crime against her. And I think at some point she probably was thinking too, how far does Stevenson's reach extend? Like if she contacted the police in Hammond, knowing that he was up there doing business, who's to say that he didn't control the police in that area? So she really just didn't know what else to do and decided instead she was just gonna kill herself. Um, she had tried initially to shoot herself with his gun when he was asleep, but somebody, um, Earl Gentry walked in at the time that she was getting ready to do it. And so she just hid the gun back in her pocket and gave up that idea. So she took this poison without them knowing it. And within minutes, she was vomiting. She was in a separate room at the time. She was vomiting and becoming just viciously sick. It just immediately started eroding her esophagus and her internal organs and everything. And Stevenson realized what she had done at one point and decided that they were going to drive back home. He tried to blackmail her and say, I'll take you to the hospital if you'll marry me. She refused to do it. She was not about to, you know, break shame on her family by marrying him. Um, he, she begged him for help all the way home and he refused to do it. When they got to his house, he put her in his garage apartment up above here and kept her there overnight, still writhing in pain. And the next day had one of his guys take her to his house when her parents were gone. Um, one of the ladies that was boarding at the house saw him come in with her and called Dr. Kingsbury right away to come and treat her. This is Dr. Kingsbury. He was a very famous doctor here in Indianapolis and you know served Irvington for more than 50 years. So um, Asa Smith, a friend of the family who was also an attorney, um, at the point that Dr. Kingsbury informed him that Madge was not going to live, she was lingering on her deathbed for almost a month. They said, if we're ever going to we're ever going to prosecute Stevenson, we need to get her statement. We need to get a full statement from her. So Asa Smith and Madge's friend Ermina um, took notes every day when they spoke to her until she became unconscious. And they, well, before she became unconscious, they compiled them 
into a dying declaration and then went through every bit of it with her and had her correct anything that was not right and attest to the, you can see this is the, a copy of the original draft. And you can see where they scratched out a few things based on her feedback about the dying declaration. Um, that document is in the Irvington. Yeah, that's in the Irvington Historical, one copy of it's in the Irvington Historical Society. Well, this eventually hit the news. They tried to keep it quiet for a while because they thought if Madge lives, you know, we don't want her to be shamed and embarrassed by everyone knowing about this sex crime, basically, even though it was really a crime of violence. Um, but when it hit the news and Stevenson was indicted, um, things really started turning about his career. He had aspired to go to the White House and it looked like that was not gonna happen. So Madge eventually did die. This is the funeral in front of her home. These pictures I got from the, the Oberholzer family, um, nobody had ever seen these before. And, um, you know, even during the trial, the eventual trial, they tried to talk about Madge having a bad reputation, but in all the contemporary news stories and all the articles and paper and people's interviews, um, they, excuse my phone, they, um, they had nothing but good things to say about her. Her college had great things to say about her. Um, Butler University posted things about her reputation. And even when they were trying to get, sorry, that's my phone. Um, even when they're trying to get bail for Stevenson while he was awaiting trial, 500 women's groups, oh, I'm sorry, over 50 women's groups wrote um, public statements in the newspaper attesting to her good character and begging that they keep him in jail. So Prosecutor Ravy was called boy prosecutor because he looked so young. And this jury from Noblesville where they moved the trial, um, this went on for a couple months. This ironic to this, this trial or this jury had some members in it that were Klansmen mm -hmm. However, at that time, the Klan had split. Those who supported Stevenson were still supporting him, but the National Klan didn't want anything to do with him anymore. So they weren't too concerned about Klansmen being in the jury. Um, at this time, women were allowed to serve on a jury and they were allowed to vote, but they didn't even bother interviewing any women for this. They said they didn't have a women's right. They said they didn't have a restroom for them in the courthouse. So, but that was a sign of the times. Um, this is Madge's family, her mother, her sister-in-law, her dad, and her brother. They went to most of the, the trial. And these are some of the witnesses that saw her in the hotel and um, could attest to the fact that she looked drugged and she looked injured and she had um, injuries on her face. And one of them was the porter on the train. But what I like about this picture, first of all, I think it's a, just a beautiful picture, but um, Two of these people are African Americans and they knew exactly who they were standing up against. And I thought it was really brave of them to be willing to, to come and testify openly about what they saw against Lucy Stevenson. Um, this was covered in papers all over the country and even out of the country. You know, they didn't always have, they didn't have the court photographers so much. So they did a lot of drawing. Here's one I think is funny, they compare him to Napoleon. And just, just a lot of coverage. I mean, anywhere from the Indianapolis Times, Tampa Tribune, Chicago Tribune. And um, they also asked for uh, Hilton U. Brown's wife to testify as a character witness, but because they determined that her character hadn't been maligned, which is a kind of borderline decision, they put her on the stand and then said, no, she can't testify. But to get her opinion out, as she walked by the jury, she said, oh, I'm so disappointed. Or I'm so sorry. I had so many wonderful things I wanted to say about Madge. So she kind of got her, got her plug in for her anyway. Um, in the end, Stevenson was found guilty and she died. A lot of people thought she died because of the poisoning that she had taken. But after the autopsy was done, what they realized was Madge died from the poisoning. Her kidneys were back working again and were fine. What killed her was one of the bites on her breast from Stevenson had become infected and she died of staph infection or you know staph infection or blood infection and so they were able to pin it on him for second degree murder this was just a few years before antibiotics had been invented so if she had lived in the era of antibiotics she probably would not have died but 
like I said, the autopsy was the reason they were able to pin this murder on him. That's him in prison. Um, after he went to prison, he thought that Jackson was gonna, going to um, pardon him, but Jackson started moving away from him because they knew that people were really anti-Klan at that point, started burning all their costumes and um, you know, leaving the Klan in droves. And so Jackson tried to remove himself from any connection with, with Stevenson. So in, in retaliation, Stevenson decided that he was gonna pull out all the dirt he had on these politicians. Um, in the end, and he had quite a bit of dirt. I mean, bribery, all kinds of things. And he had evidence too. It's something. And some of the evidence was hidden in these black boxes that were in somebody's barn in Southern Indiana. So he ended up in the end, Ed Jackson lost his office. Mayor Duval lost his office. Several local politicians lost their offices. And it was really quite the scandal of the day. So much so that. There's the Chicago Tribune. Um, when he tried to get paroled, 5,000 women came forward to try to keep him in jail. And this was in 1930. So people were still very active about keeping him in prison. And his mom and brother, as long as his mom was alive, would come to the clemency hearings, as well as some of the sorority sisters and some of the um, Hilton U. Brown family. He ended up trying, he was his own attorney at these trial or at these clemency hearings, he ended up studying law in prison and what passed the bar in like three different states, just learning on his own, even though he had only had an eighth grade education. That's a great picture here. He was paroled in 1950, finally, but he was rearrested later that year after attempting to, um, after violating his parole, he was supposed to keep, let them know where he was all the time and he didn't do it. So they brought him back, put him back in jail again. He was released in 1956. And um, he got caught then trying to abduct a 16 year old. I might be getting this confused with the first release, but um, the judge, this was in Minnesota. The judge charged him, I think it was $300 and said, don't ever come back. He moved to Southern Indiana where he married a woman that didn't have well, she knew about his past and then he left her and ended up in Tennessee with another woman. This, I cut a few out, but the, this is the fourth wife, wife. Um, and she didn't know anything about his past. And when she died, she talked about what a wonderful man he was and um, how he used to take the kids to the swimming hole. You know, I'm like, ugh. <laughs> um, the Indianapolis Times covered the trial and all the scandal that followed it and ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize about it. And then when we talk about Madge um, and what she, what her testimony and everything contributed, her autopsy was the first one admitted as evidence in Indiana. Um, they set a legal precedence when they accepted her dying declaration in court as an exemption to the hearsay rule. They accepted it just as if it was testimony. They changed the regulations of bichloride of mercury, which at that point had been could buy it over the counter and it then became more regulated and became something that you had to see the pharmacist to get. She was kind of a leader in the whole speaking truth to power. Um, she had a lot to lose by coming forward. She could have lost her reputation. Her family could have been maligned. Um, you know, there were just a lot of negatives. There were several women that he had actually abused before and none of them had come forward. Um, a lot of men that worked for him knew the kind of man he was behind closed doors and none of them came forward and Madge was the only one that was willing to put it all on the line and tell the truth. Um, the trial and the cross examinations that um, took place during the trial became very, um, very important examples of trial law. They're still studied in a lot of the law schools in Indiana and outside of the state. And several books were written using um, examples from the trial as cross-examination examples to show how the best way to cross-examine somebody was. And then most importantly, she altered the course of politics in Indiana because she brought Stevenson down and ended his ambitions to get to the White House. Um, he even admitted himself that he, if he had gotten to the White House, it probably wouldn't have been a democracy anymore. It probably would have been more like a dictatorship. Um, so. You, know, you never know what course things would have taken if it had been a different outcome.
And that's really all I have tonight. I hope if you want to learn more that you check my book out of the library or read it or something. And you, there's a lot more detail that is related to Indiana history and clan history and just a lot of, I think there's 2,100 footnotes. So I researched it very thoroughly in case anybody questioned anything. So, any questions? It was about a four year project, even though I'd kind of been interested in it for many years. But um, part of the reason it took four years was I was still working full time as a medical interpreter. And um, I also remember And then on top of that, COVID limited how many places I could go to for research because they had limited hours or limited number of people that could come. I had to juggle with my work schedule. And sometimes a lot of those places were only open during the weekdays when I was working. So it really struck, and plus I'm not a writer, I'm an amateur writer, so I'm sure I would be more, much more efficient if I ever did something like this again, but I will never do this again. <laughs> <laughs> she had a family. And every, the whole family had been mad for four years. <laughs> the autopsy at the time of death, it was about a month after the incident. Well, yes, yes. And they could find all these bruises and tears well, they, and they, things at that time? They documented a lot of the bruises before she died. So the charts that they used were from the time she died. And then they documented a lot of the bruises after she died. And they found the bruises that she had had before she died. And they found the bruises that she had had before she died. And they found the bruises that she had had before she died. And they found the bruises that she had had before she died. And they found the bruises that she had had before she died. And they found the bruises that she had and that's why she went to Chicago, and then she was just not this good girl, and that's why she took the poison because that actual poison was also used as an orthopastic, which they kind of was actually and not orally, but they proved that she took it orally, so that would not have been accurate. Plus, and he wanted her exhumed to re examine her organs, which would have been pointless because her organs, most of them had already been removed. So, um, and they just, they basically chastised him. You know, make that, you know, she could need to defend herself. But that idea about her abortion, for decades her story started um, evolving into, oh, she was a seduced woman, oh, she was probably pregnant, and there is nothing in the contemporary evidence to show any of that, that she had any questionable reputation. Um, there was no evidence when they found her after the incident that indicated she was pregnant or that she had had any kind of a mechanical abortion. Um, you know, they didn't actually prove it entirely, but it just, you know, and there's more details that I, I did a whole chapter on um, she, basing that whole theory of her being pregnant based on some of her, based on a menstrual cycle and you know, it was part of that she's had a period after, you know, that she's, I mean, all kinds of things that were proved that. 99% sure she hadn't been right there at any portion. I mean, this is a little bit more about your interest and motivation and why you chose to spend well, four years of your life. Or so. Well, it started um, a little bit before that. I was doing family genealogy, and one of my family names is Stevenson, spelled the same way. Oh. And his name kept popping up, but there's no relationship at all. I mean, it kept popping up. And I and about the same time I moved to Irvington, so I, I started hearing that story. And again, there was so much written about Stevenson and Plan during that era, but I was like, what are these women? I said, no, I don't have a question to say who she is. And then after reading a little bit more, kind of research here just casually, I also found out that she was in the same sorority that I was in. Oh, really? And so I was able to go to the Butler High Five archives because I'm a high five myself and go through their chapter minutes and go through their chapter archives and find even more information about her and her life at college that nobody else would have the ability to get because they don't have access to those documents. So I was able to kind of fill in her life early on, all the way through to her death. And like I said, even for family, you know, she studied at this really well known artist of things. So her brother, Marshall, um, it, it was his grandchildren that I interviewed. And they talked about their grandfather, Marshall, just not even being able to talk about it. 
Oh. It was a book that had a chapter about the incident in it, and he described it to his grandchildren and gave it to them. That was about the student's conversation with him. So I think a lot of information about her life, most of the artifacts related to her are gone because they just didn't know the story enough to recognize that something was related to her life. Oh. Yeah, but they did, they were very gracious. They gave me their family Bibles. Um, and, and some other things that are now kept at the Irvington Historical Society archives. So they were very generous with what they knew, but I ended up teaching them as much about their family as they did. Wow. They were they were really surprised. Any other questions? Uh, did they consider other charges against Stevenson, such as uh, kidnapping. kidnapping or man, even federal man act? Um, not that, but they did um, charge him with kidnapping, but I'm not sure that I think that might have just folded it. It's a lesser two, charge. But the two men um, were also tried, they were trying to kidnap him, and they were completely not guilty. Which point, one thing that is interesting that Point was the one that brought her back to the house and brought the dog after the incident. Gentry was the one that was up in the bird while all this was taking place and she was, you know, being molested, didn't do a thing. I, it's hard for me to understand why he didn't get charged or convicted of something that they didn't. He found this. But he got, yeah, he he got this in the end. In the end, he ended up moving up to Wisconsin, I think it was, and it was murder. So, <laughs> sorry. Oh, she did. I was following up on that. Yeah, my favorite part of the book is in the back. Some of the main characters, not characters, but main people in the book, I kind of followed them through the rest of their lives to see what they ended up doing. Um, this my black man. Prosecutor. Yeah, he was a prosecutor. Um, well, first he's my black started out as a reporter, and he covered the beginnings of the trial. Then later on, he became a prosecutor, and when Stevenson um, began seeking for role, because by that time he had become an attorney himself, and he helped uh, work against him. And then he later became a judge. And then there were other women that Stevenson had been involved in. Um, one of them committed suicide in the 1970s in a hotel in Georgia, Indianapolis. Another one of them had a pretty involved relationship that supposedly was engaged in him. She left him, went to Purdue, um, where she became a secretary and started the first secretarial pool up there. Worked there for many years, and she was high by herself, and she was an um, alumni president up there. Never got married, nobody ever knew her connection with the plan. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So it's just oh. some of the some of the ways these lives evolved later was very interesting to me. And some of the doctors that helped treat her, in addition to Kingsbury, um, he had assaulted some expert doctors here at what was considered the med center then. And a lot of these, one of them became um, one of the foremost authorities on um, diabetes when it was when insulin was first being invented. He became very, you know, one of the leaders in that. And another one had a chair, a chair person's position named after him even just a couple of years ago. And then the man who helped with the autopsy of the Sandy performance in the 1930s, he invented the first breathalyzer. So it's just kind of bizarre little things. And there's a rock outside of one of the buildings that I felt I got on the show one day before I was looking at that. Oh my gosh, that's the guy in the story. He found the fertilizer. There's a rock with this plaque on it. So, so they were still relevant even many, many years later. Part of their experience came from helping with this trial and acting as expert um, witnesses. Her grave is at um, it's a little East Washington Street. It's called. Yes, Washington Street. Yes, and she's buried there with her mom and dad and. Um, Hers are the smaller ones, but that's the old one. Right inside. I think one of the first. Yeah, there. she was one of the one of the first, you know, probably 50 to be buried there. Oh. And in my book, you'll see a copy of the the burial receipt. They Shirley Brothers still had a receipt from her funeral in their archives. Oh. Believe it or not. And Eli Lilly still had a copy of her work record. So it's just oh. amazing what I was able to find. <laughs> Just don't think whatever even well, still be around. Oh yeah. Yeah, talking about the different things that she had done in the chapter house and the part.
parties that she had known from the campus and from the faculty and her house. And we would have known any of that. Some of it was in the papers, but um, a lot of it was just those two minute, chapter minutes about inviting the whole campus sorority recruiting group over to her house or inviting all the faculty over. So it was very, very interesting. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just, you know, I like I was telling you, I'm not a writer. I'm sure that my mistakes came up. I tried to document anything that I thought might come in question. Um, but at least I got her story out, and that she gets to sign her this scenario now. Thank you. Ron, did you want to say anything in conclusion here? Well, uh, I'm very, very proud of my wife, Mr. It's getting good reviews on Amazon. That's great. We need to sell more books. Yeah, we need to for sale right here. Book, book, book. Book. Yeah, I think we can get an autograph for you, too. Okay. <laughs> after we go to the. Yes, after the first episode, you're going to the Royal Society. Mm -hmm. It's her first day in the Uh-huh. Madge Augustine told her that she was named after a best friend. It's her grandfather. They gave her the name Augustine as her real name. To me, that was not a name. That sounds like an abbreviation. It's, it's kind of an old, I think, American name. It's kind of like they're trying to think of small something. Yeah. But on the first, let's say, man, August. Yeah. 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 Yeah.